I know how hard it can be to feel brave, to feel empowered, to stand up for what you believe in. But I also know that with the right help, you can move through your challenges if you just take that first step. And that, my friend, is where the bravery begins. What does it mean to you to live your best and bravest life? Does it mean being strong and forthright? Do you think of bravery as a woman or a man in uniform wearing stars or medals? Or does it mean being vulnerable, honest and courageous in all that you do? To be brave can mean so many things. To me, being brave is just that doing things even in the face of difficulty. It is my mission in life to help you feel brave and empowered to live as your authentic self so that you can be fulfilled in a life you love living to live your best and bravest life. I believe in the power of self-belief because when we are our authentic selves, magic comes our way and it spreads like wildfire for others to join in. I know that together we are going to live our best and bravest life. So join me in these inspirational conversations filled with tips and tricks to help you live your best and bravest life. I'm Tiffany Johnson and this is the When We Are Brave podcast. Welcome to the When We Are Brave podcast. I am so excited for you to join me today. Thank you to everyone who is tuning in on the When We Are Brave podcast and for sharing the podcast with your friends and family, people on social media. We are well and truly over the 1500 listens now and I'm so excited for that. So thank you everybody for sharing. So please continue to do so. It really does mean the absolute world to me. And we have now a global audience, people in Asia, Europe, America, South America, uh, Australasia through Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific Islands. So we really are reaching a global audience and I am so incredibly thankful. So thank you for tuning in. Now, today's episode is a little bit different to the other episodes that have been on the When We Are Brave podcast. And that is because today's episode is just me. There's no interview today. And there's a reason for that. I wanted to know how you're going and just to have a little chat with you because these last few months have really been a roller coaster. And I know myself just how many challenges that I've faced personally within our family and also within our world and within our communities. And I know how hard that can be. It certainly has been a time like no other, and I'm sure that it is one that we will all remember in years to come. And when we look back at 2020, we will be able to say, I survived. I know what it takes to feel like you've survived something. It's taken me 20 years or 21 years this year to share my own story of survival from the Swiss Canyoning disaster. My book, Brave Enough Now, took me 20 years to release. But what sharing my story has done has opened up so many new doors for my life and I feel so blessed to be sharing them all with you. I wanted to share with you a story about a time when I wasn't feeling very brave at all and how I took the steps forward, how I reached out. I took a huge, big breath and I faced my biggest fear. And that was probably the moment in my life when it was the bravest that I have ever been. And seeing as this is the When We Are Brave podcast, I thought it was time that I shared it with you. So about this time last year, I was getting ready for an enormous trip overseas. I hadn't been overseas for about four years, and my last trip was a business trip to Hong Kong with my beautiful mother. But this trip last year that we were taking was very, very different. The trip we were doing was returning to the place that changed my life forever. June 2019 looked significantly different to me. I was busy. I was highly anxious. I'd not long gone on an insulin pump, a Medtronic 670G for my type 1 diabetes, and I was trying to manage this new way of living. 
having a pump attached to me to 24-7 cannulas, changing cannulas, a continuous blood glucose sensor attached to me. I felt like I was a walking hospital. Not only did I have this new way of living, which I have to add in, has actually completely changed my life and I now would not live without it through its many different complications and challenges it has brought me. I am so much healthier. So praise the Lord for amazing technology. But I also had this incredible trip approaching and I had been putting off this trip for 20 years. And I was in the middle of publishing my first ever book, Brave Enough Now, and that journey alone had been a roller coaster. Even writing the book had brought out so many different emotions that I thought I'd dealt with and new things that I really hadn't dealt with. It was incredibly cathartic to write it. But with amazing agents and publishing houses all interested and all wanting my book, they couldn't release my book until later in the year. And that was never in my plan. You see, my book, Brave Enough Now, is dedicated to my friends who died in the Swiss canyoning disaster. And I felt like I had a calling to have the book there when I would go back to give them the gift of knowing that their lives will always be remembered. Even though the book is written solely from my own experiences, and it's totally about my own experience, what happened to me in the lead up to that fateful day and how I was managing a whole world of different emotions and traumas that I'd had to deal with and other things that happened to me, this book is solely my own journey. I really wanted it to be with me when I took that trip. So I went it alone and I self-published so that I could have it available for the 27th of July, 2019. Now, I love to travel and I love experiencing new places and new food, meeting new people, but this trip was not going to be new. Yes, it would be a different experience, and yes, I would try new food. I hadn't before, perhaps, but it wasn't the sort of trip that you are excited about in terms of traveling at a holiday, and I was still doing a whole bunch of work for the book at the same time. And this trip would be facing my greatest ever fear, and I didn't know if I could do it. I was going back to the Saxton Park Gorge in Switzerland, where the 1999 Swiss canyoning disaster took place, of which I survived. An international memorial event was scheduled to be held for the 27th of July, 2019. Actually, I think it was on the 26th of July because of the way that the dates fell on weekends and things. But anyway, that's beside the point. The date of the accident is the 27th of July. Now, this memorial event was something that I really needed to go to. I needed to go for a number of reasons. I needed to go back and see that place. I needed to go back and connect with fellow travellers, families and other people that had been through that experience different to mine because all of our experiences, although we were in there together, were all very individual. And I needed to finish a part of my healing, I think, was really what I needed to do. But to know that there would be international dignitaries that were attending this memorial event, there were letters written from the Australian government from the former Governor-General, who also supported my book, Sir William Dean. He wrote me many letters about my book, Brave Enough Now, and I was incredibly honoured to have his support. It was a huge, big deal to have that, and I'm so thankful and incredibly privileged. But it also made me put into perspective the significance of the disaster, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that also at the memorial event... The beautiful person that was organising it, who was a very special person indeed, had asked me if I would sing at the memorial event. And I never sung at my aunt's funeral, the one who I mention in Brave Enough Now. My auntie died. I never sang at her funeral. And that's not been a regret, but I guess I have curiosity around what would have happened if I had of I used to sing professionally for many, many years. I don't anymore. 
my jaw was too badly damaged in the accident. I can't hit the high notes anymore. And so that's okay. I'm totally fine with that. I sing all the time in the kitchen with my daughter, which is so much fun. But I needed to do that as terrified as I was. I have really bad stage fright for singing, which is crazy because I've done so many performances in my life, but always just before I stand on stage, (coughs) the nerves kick in. But to do this for this event in front of former prime minister of Switzerland was there. He remembered me. It was amazing. Consulate of Australia was there. The so many so many important people were there. Families were there, relatives, cousins, everybody that had been affected. Well, not everybody could make it, but so many people were there. And it was my gift to them that I could give them the gift of song to both those who were still with us and those who had perished. It was probably my first singing performance that I've done in Oh, goodness, I don't remember the last time I did a professional sort of in public performance of singing. But I knew that I needed to deal with some things before I could actually do this performance. And this was going to be the hardest performance of my life. And let me tell you, it absolutely was. But it was probably also the most rewarding because I honestly believed and felt that I was giving my friends who were lost a gift. And if their souls were still in that canyon, as my voice echoed up in the ravine, that they could hear it and they could know how much we still remembered them. And that was so, so powerful. But I knew that I couldn't do that until I had done something else. And that would all start by getting on a plane. We were traveling as a family, my husband, my kids, my best friend and her brother, who were also part of my family, we all got on the plane together and I took a huge, deep breath as I was about to walk onto that plane. Now, it's a long way from Melbourne to Zurich. There were movies, snaps, bad aeroplane food, and eventually we were crossing land and coming into Switzerland. We were over the plane flight by now. We were fairly fed up with being on that aeroplane. I was sitting in my seat and my children were going up and down the aisles trying to stretch their legs and they'd been walking a bit and they came up to me so fast, not quite running, but almost as much as you can do on the aisle of a plane. They'd never been overseas before, so this was such a new adventure for them. And they said to me, Mummy, 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 quick, quick, come take a look. So I got up and I headed to the part of the plane where there was a window that I could look out. Now on the earth... I saw below me the most terrifying thing that I had ever seen. My body froze. I felt like I had just woken up from a nightmare. You know that moment when you wake up from a nightmare and your heart is pounding at a thousand miles an hour and you are stuck solid. I felt like that. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I could barely breathe. I could hear the sound of the plane and my children's voices in the distance underneath the sound of the water rushing, coming back to my mind. I could feel the iciness of the flood. I could feel the thrashing and crashing of the water and the logs and the debris and goodness knows what else was pounding into my flesh. I was having instant flashbacks and I hadn't had these for many years. And what brought on those flashbacks when I looked out that window was the first time I had seen the Swiss Alps in 20 years and I was absolutely terrified. Everyone on the plane was looking out the window in wonder and amazement, but not me. The kids had gone back to their seat, and when my husband looked up, he saw that the colour had completely drained from my face. And by now there were tears flowing like their own flood, just falling out of my eyes, and I still couldn't move. And he came over to me, he held me, and I just was shivering and shaking in fear, almost paralysed in fear. I was going to go back to that place, the place that lost five of my friends, 21 lives in total, and the place that changed my life forever in so many ways. And it was the place and the thing that I was most afraid of. 
The thing was that I didn't actually know that I was going to feel like this. When I first knew that I was going to go back and I'd made that conscious decision, I didn't think that it would be seeing the beautiful vista out of the plane window that would bring back mountains of flashbacks. I thought maybe it would be the smell or the feeling of the air against my skin or something else that would bring everything back, but not the plane. I didn't think it was going to happen as soon as I saw the Alps. And I was so scared. I desperately wanted to get off that plane then and there and ask the captain to turn around. I even asked my husband, (laughs) can you go and ask the captain to turn the plane around? I was being ridiculous, but that's what fear does. And I knew, or I thought, perhaps I had made a huge mistake in going over. When we touched down, everything felt so surreal It would be three days until I would be back in the canyon again. We had other things that we had to do before we were going there and I was incredibly grateful of that time to adjust myself. But getting into the canyon was trickier than I had expected. The images were so clear in my mind that I didn't think that I'd need a map. I'm really known quite well in my family for my navigational skills. In fact, I have a nickname. My children call me like a superhero name, Navigator. (laughs) It's kind of the running joke in the family. Take me one place once and I'll always find my way back again. But everything had changed and things happen in 20 years. And one of the things that had happened was that the road had actually been ripped out and a new road put in not long after the accident. There'd been another flash flood a couple of years later and it had completely changed the landscape. Now, when the Swiss canyoning disaster happened in 99, I was in that canyon and whole boulders were being pushed. So if there's been other floods, I'm sure that there were indeed other boulders too that had been pushed by the sheer force of that water. And I'm not surprised that everything had changed so much in such a long period of time. We couldn't find the entry point to get into the canyon. And I always knew that when I went back to Switzerland that I was going to go back with Cassandra, my best friend. So the two of us were ready to go and find this entry point, but we could not find it anywhere. So we ended up in Saxton, which is a village not far from the gorge, and a local helped us. And before he helped us getting into the canyon, he made sure that we felt safe. And I was forever grateful for that. The other thing that happened with that particular man, who and I don't speak a word of Swiss German, so trying to communicate was interesting. He did actually speak a little bit of English, so we were able to sort of point out what we were trying to do. But he had heard of my book. This is a guy on the other side of the world who had heard about my book, Brave Enough Now. It was amazing. It was, it was a crazy moment for me trying to communicate how do I get into the scariest place in my possible life that I've ever gone back to and oh I've heard about you've written a book it was a very surreal moment that was for sure and you have to keep in mind as well that the Swiss canyoning disaster was the largest natural disaster in Swiss history with foreigners in Switzerland they call the 27th of July the day Switzerland held its breath it was the largest number of deaths on foreign soil for Australians outside of wartime, so during peacetimes at the time of the event in 1999. The disaster reached worldwide news, including the New York Times, the BBC, and over 200 journalists from around the world were camped outside of our chalet at the time that the disaster happened. It was all over the news. It was everywhere. And when I actually got home back to Australia after the disaster happened, There were still helicopters from news channels flying over our country farm, TV crews parked down our street. It was incredibly intense. And as such, there has been a beautiful memorial space created, dedicated to those 21 young lives that were lost on the 27th of July 1999 in the Swiss canyoning disaster. And this would be where the memorial event would be held and where I would be singing as part of that memorial. And where it's located is right next to 
the Saxton Bark Gorge. In fact, you can hear the water running when you're standing at the memorial site. There are members of the local community who volunteer and regularly maintain that memorial site. There are flags, there's a wall with memorabilia, photos, mementos of those who perished in the canyon. And I've actually got some beautiful photos of the memorial, which I'll actually put on the show notes of today's show if you're interested in seeing that space. It's a very, very sacred and beautiful site. The memorial was happening the very next day, but I really needed to get through a whole bunch of stuff before I went to that event. I felt like I needed to face my fear. I felt that I needed to do that before I reconnected with everybody whom I traveled with. And some of these people I hadn't seen in 20 years, people were coming from all over the globe for this particular memorial event. And as travel companions go, Cassandra was one of my travel companions back then. Now, some of you may have heard me talk about Cassandra before, and she will be on the show in a few episodes time, but Cassandra and I met during our travels and we had this incredible connection She's my kindred spirit. And in fact, I've spoken to her twice today. I live 10 minutes away from her and um, I, I'd be lost without her. And I knew that I had to do this trip with her. So the two of us were holding hands as we entered into the canyon. Cassandra didn't go canyoning on the day that I went canyoning, but her cousin did and her cousin's best friend. And they were her travel companions and her cousin died, and her cousin's best friend survived. And she's also a survivor, just as I am. And there are quite a few of us who survived this horrific event. And Cassandra was so, so brave. And there's more about her story in my book, but that's for another day. But us both being there together was incredibly special. So we stuck to our word, that we'd promised each other for years and years and years if ever we went back we would go together and that's exactly what we did. Now when I was holding her hand I was thinking what was going to be the trigger that made me remember everything like what had happened on the plane. I was really worried that I was going to go into a panic mode into that shock that I'd had when I saw the Alps but that kind of didn't happen but what did happen was the memory of the leaf litter. Now leaf litter is like you know Um, when leaves have fallen and they're um, becoming compost on the ground, especially in autumn when you are kicking through the leaves. We've been doing that lots lately when we've been going on walks with the kids. All the leaves have fallen and it's beautiful. But in the forest, in the canyon, there's a lot of leaf litter. There are a lot of trees. And it was the leaf litter that I remembered and I just remembered being covered in it from head to toe. I was blowing out that leaf litter out of my nose for months. It was in my eyes, it was in my eyelids, it was up my nose, it was in my ears, it was all through my mouth, it was in places it shouldn't have been. It was bad. And it was that leaf litter that brought back memories that I had long forgotten. It wasn't the smell of the earth, it wasn't the sound of the leaves rustling in the breeze, it wasn't even the sound of the water, it was the feeling of the leaf litter. As we're walking along the path, we could see through the trees, a bit of the canyon. It's a very dense canyon. There's lots of foliage around, lots of forest. It's beautiful. It's like the Garden of Eden. It's just a magical place. And I could hear the water. And I, this time, unlike when I was on the plane, this time it was for real. I could actually hear the water. It wasn't in my head. And I could see snippets of the water flowing as I looked through those trees. And in that moment, my heart skipped a beat. And I stopped again, like I did on the plane, when I realised that my greatest fear was standing, or not standing because water doesn't stand, but my greatest fear was right in front of me. It was there. I could smell it. I could hear it. I could touch it if I wanted to. And my biggest fear was the water. It wasn't actually the canyon itself or the space, the trees or the branches or anything or the boulders. My greatest fear was the water. 
It took me a long time to realise how the water had scared me so much over the years. I can't go into the surf anymore. The sensation of the water is just too much for me, of the movement of the water against my body. I'm fine in a river or a creek. I'm fine in a bay or a pool or a lake. Nothing with running water. It's a sensation that I just have never really been able to conquer and I'm still working on that and I will probably work on that probably for a very long time. But in the canyon and I stood there, I couldn't believe that I was there again. The place that took so many lives, broke so many of my bones, gave me a lifelong illness that has affected so many other parts of my life having type 1 diabetes. But this time I knew that I was safe And I would continue to be safe. There was a metal bridge that had been erected that went from one side of the canyon over the canyon to the other side. And I stood there at the beginning of the bridge with the water rushing underneath me. I was in a lather of sweat. I could barely breathe. I took a great, big, deep breath. And I knew I had to walk over it. Every sensation in my body told me to run, to run as far away as humanly possible, to leave that place, leave the water and never, ever, ever go back. But I'd come this far. I'd travelled 16,412 kilometres to be precise, 27 hours on a plane, an hour and a half on a train and 20 years of my life. I was going to walk across that bridge. I hung onto the railing, walking ever so slowly, taking each step with the utmost care so that I didn't slip. It was all enclosed, and if I did slip, I would just end up on the floor of the bridge, but I still took the utmost care. And then I began yelling at the top of my lungs, I am safe! I am safe! I am safe! I am safe! Now, this is a technique that I learnt whilst undergoing intensive therapy through the post-traumatic stress disorder clinic at Westmead Hospital in Sydney all those years ago, and it's a technique that I still use today and obviously I needed to use then. And I was safe and I am safe. And when I got to the other side, I looked down into the canyon and decided that I wanted to go down into the canyon. I don't know why I thought this was a good idea, but I did. But once again, I'd come this far and I was going to make the most of it. I wanted to go to the water. I don't know why, but it was somehow part of my healing. So we made our way down a very dodgy ladder that someone had put there. As people still go canyoning in the Saxton Buck Gorge, but this ladder was very far from safe, and I couldn't actually believe what I was doing. And then we came to a rock, a giant boulder, And just like the one I had been pushed up against, this was a moment when I saw my life again. And this time, I saw how far I'd come. I wanted to get to the water as close as possible, but it was actually going to be near impossible. The boulder we were now on was wet from the spray of the water, kind of like sea spray, but it's freshwater spray, so it was just canyon water spray. And I figured that I was touching the water by touching the boulder that was wet, and so therefore I was touching the water. And I was okay with that. Sitting there with a very wet bottom in that place, a magical, sacred, special place filled with the beauty that only Mother Nature can provide, I had the most overwhelming sense of peace. Everything was going to be okay. All the lives that were lost they too were okay. And somehow it felt like they were talking to me, telling me that it was okay to let them go. It was okay to move forward. It was okay to share, to serve and to help others, to use my story to help people. It was a magical, magical moment. And I feel so blessed to have experienced it. Walking out of the canyon, it was steep and difficult. Making our way through the forest, it was hard to believe that I had climbed out somehow with a broken leg and all my other injuries on the day of the accident, on the day of the disaster. But that is the amazing thing about our bodies. And adrenaline is a wondrous thing, that's for sure. 
And just like the first time I was in that place, I stopped halfway up the mountain, heading back towards the road. The first time, I had been fired up on that magical hormone, adrenaline. And I'm sure I had some of it now again the second time around. But this time, I knew I was brave. And if I thought I had been brave before, that was nothing than how it was to stand there, sit there, touch it, smell it, hear the place that changed my life forever, to face my biggest fear. It was an experience that I will be forever grateful for. I'm also grateful for this time and the time to come and the time that has been and for the life that I have led and everything that that includes, all the bad times or the good times or the excellent times or the amazing times or the normal times or the everyday times, I'm just constantly in gratitude for this amazing gift of life. And so I ask you this, When there has been a time in your life when you have had to face something you never thought you could, as I really didn't know if I could face the water, how does it make you feel? I know I talk about this all the time, but I really want you to dig deep and think about some of the questions that I would love for you to consider. What does it mean to you to live your best and bravest life? What does it mean to you to be brave? When you think about being brave, what do you think? And do you think you are brave? Because I bet that you are. And I bet that you can be in everything that you do. And what would it mean to you to be brave in your life if you were brave? How would your life change? I know my life changed in that moment again in the canyon. And it told me that I can I can do it and I can face my fears and I have lots of other fears. We all have fears in our life. We're all human. But when we face them, when we move through them, it really can be liberating. I know how hard it can be to feel brave, to feel empowered, to stand up for what you believe in. But I know that with the right help, you can move through your challenges. If you just take that very first step, And that, my friends, is where the bravery begins. If I can stand back in that canyon, then you can face whatever it is in your life that you need to face, move through that fear and really tune in to who you are. There is a great episode on the When We Are Brave podcast about moving through fear. So if this is something that you're really interested in, I highly recommend that you tune into that one. It's a great episode and it has lots of great tips on how you can do it. Now, not only are the episodes on the When We Are Brave podcast out there to help you in your life of moving towards bravery, embracing your bravery, being brave in your everyday life, which can be so incredibly challenging and yet so incredibly rewarding. I have a new book about to be released in paperback. It's so exciting. It is exciting. I actually, I've been wanting to do this for so long and I've talked about it quite a bit, but my new journal, Discovering Your Brave, a guided journal to uncover your best and bravest self is about to be released in paperback. And it is all of the tools that I have used to be brave in my life in different areas and different times. And it's helped me so, so much. And I honestly hope that it will help you too. And I know that when you do live your brave life, that you will feel rewarded and you will live an amazing life that you love, that is freeing, that is liberating, and it is just there waiting for you. So that's a little story about my own journey and discovering my own bravery, being back in the canyon. That was big stuff, was stuff I didn't really know that I could do. And I am so blessed to be able to share that with you on today's episode on the When We Are Brave podcast. Now, I would absolutely love it if you would join my mailing list if you're interested. I have so many different tips and tricks on my website, but also I will share with you every week the podcast episode. 
going to give you a few tips along the way on how we can all be braver in our everyday life. So if that's something you're interested in, head over to tiffanyjohnson.com.au. If you'd like to know any more about me or you'd like to get a copy of my book, you can go onto Amazon. It's available in ebook as a paperback and it's about to be available as an audio book. So that's about to be released soon as well. I've been a very busy bee lately. So my friends, if you want to connect with me, I would love to hear from you. Please reach out, contact me on any of the social pages on my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest. I'm everywhere. So if you would like to connect, please, please do so. It would be so wonderful to hear from you. And remember to join my list so that we can connect and I can send you the episodes every week on the When We Are Brave podcast so that you will be filled with lots of amazing tips and tools and inspirational stories to help you live your best and bravest life. So my friends, be brave until next time and live your best and bravest life.